Welcome to the fifth uh, National Particle Therapy Symposium. Um, if everybody could just take their seats, uh, we'll close the door. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome um, everybody to SAMRI again. Um, this is the uh, fifth National Particle Therapy Symposium. We've done a full circle through all the jurisdictions and we're back here in Adelaide. And I think it's very timely we're back here in Adelaide because we've got lots of exciting updates uh, for you as a community about where we're up to with proton therapy in Australia and the region. My name is Peter Greisky. I'm the uh, convener of this year's meeting. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you again uh, to our symposium. So we'll begin by um, importantly acknowledge, uh, our acknowledgement of country. So we're actually meeting on the lands of the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region where we meet today. Uh, we recognize the Ghana people's, Ghana people's culture, spiritual, physical, and emotional connection with the land. We honor and pay our respects to Ghana elders, both past and present, and all generations of Ghana people now and into the future. We acknowledge the other traditional owners who live across South Australia, where ABC PTI research might be conducted. And importantly, this is a hybrid event for the first time um, for these particle, uh, particle therapy symposia. So I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which our online delegates are uh, zooming in from. So welcome to day one. Um, and I, this is just a really exciting time. A lot of work has gone into this. And I hope that today we uh, bring together um, our growing network of um, stakeholders in particle therapy uh, here in Australia. Like I mentioned, this is a hybrid event for the first time. So we have professional IT support to make this meeting work and be a success, but no doubt we probably might run into some technical difficulties. So bear with us as we um, move through the program. There are over 60 delegates um, here with us today in the SAMRI Symposium and remarkably, um, over 175 are going to be zooming in online during the day. On day one, I think, as you'll see in the program, which is available in your bags this morning and online through the Eventbrite page, is the final program for the symposiums day one and two. And I think uh, it's important to acknowledge the, the broader objectives that we're trying to achieve from this year's symposia. It's important that we move the dialogue forward to actually putting um, uh, wheels in motion, as it were, to, to actually make this happen uh, in the real world. We are only a few years away from Australia actually having a proton beam service. So these meetings are very important and timely as we progress to that date. During uh, the next two days, we will have rotating chairpersons for each session. They're not listed on the program, but they will be introduced um, at, the, at, the, at their time. And we do encourage, as always, as a growing community, dynamic exchanges and input from all delegates. We will have the opportunity to ask questions here in the room. And so there is a microphone set up in the very center of the room with a camera on it as well. That's because previously somebody walking around with a, a microphone uh, made it difficult to actually put a camera on them. So this is uh, an important um, uh, step for those in the room. For those online delegates, uh, the Zoom function uh, will have a chat section, as well as a hand where you can raise your hand and ask uh, permission to ask questions. So we will be able to hear you and see you if you wish, if you are online and want to ask a question. So I encourage you to do that. And lastly, we will also, as per all the other symposia, come out with a communique at the conclusion of the symposium, which will reflect this community's um, stakeholder uh, goals and objectives moving forward. SAMRI is but one uh, of several jurisdictions who have advanced business cases for particle therapy in Australia. And so together as a community, we need to reflect on that and the objectives going forward. And so I will actually email that out at 4 p.m. today to all delegates registered for the symposium. Any feedback will be received over the next 12 to 24 hours before my friend, uh, boss and colleague, uh, Michael Penniment will close the meeting tomorrow. 
and actually incorporate the feedback into that final communique. After which about one or two weeks uh, will we'll go where further feedback will be sought and incorporated prior to it being released to the public. Just a few more housekeeping things, if I may. Um, this meeting is going to be recorded. So any sessions that you don't uh, uh, are unable to access uh, in real time, you'll be able to access um, in a recorded format. And if you could just kindly silence your phones in the room so we don't get any feedback um, um, over, over, the, uh, over Zoom. So with that, let's get started. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Scott Penfold. He's actually the lead medical physicist for the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research. So welcome, Scott. He's going to provide an update on the project. Thank you, Peter. Uh, nice to see so many uh, familiar faces in person here with us and hello to everyone online as well. Um, so it's my great privilege to be able to um, share some, some of the updates on the Australian Bragg Centre, uh, give you an idea of where we're up to and uh, all of the design that has gone into getting us to this point. So I wanted to start off um, with a bit of an overview of how we got to where we are today. So it was back in uh, May of 2017 when uh, the federal budget commitment was made uh, to, to provide $68 million to SAMRI to purchase a proton therapy system. Shortly after that, uh, the South Australian state government also committed $44 million to the project. Uh, following on from that, for, for the next 12 month uh, period, uh, there was a process of proton therapy vendor selection, uh, technical, legal, um, uh, financial due diligence performed by SAMRI, and also the early stages of design for the facility as well. So roughly around August of 2018, uh, we got to stage one design completion, where we were able to um, uh, put everything in place on site and, and have a high level view of how, how the facility might work. Uh, and that it wasn't until uh, the end of 2018 when the National Partnership Agreement was signed. And that's an agreement that allows the transfer of funds from the federal government to SAMRI. Uh, so there was no previous mechanism for that. So that all had to be implemented and obviously took time to, to make that happen. Between uh, the, the, the start of 2019 and uh, around mid 2020, uh, there were several large things that were happening. So the, the site next door where the Australian Bragg Centre is located, that was previously occupied by the, uh, the Adelaide train control station. So all of the Metro trains in Adelaide were controlled from that site. So that had to be moved to a, another site north of the city. Um, there were also uh, key commercial terms being sorted out with the building contractor. Uh, the tenancies of the other floors of the building were being finalized. So there are a number of commercial uh, tasks happening in that period as well. So it was in around mid uh, 2020 that we were able to commence uh, site remediation work. So uh, really starting to form the hole in which the building uh, would come out of. And, and to do that, we actually required an EPA uh, radiation facility license to prepare the site. And that, that was uh, granted in, in, the, uh, in the months leading up to the commencement of site remediation works. Uh, in a, at the end of 2020, we got to stage two design completion. Uh, so that, that took it from floor plans and elevations to uh, really into a, a functioning building uh, so that we would um, be able to uh, model all of, the, all of the penetrations through the bunker and add that real level of detail that made it a real uh, building and not just nice floor plans. In, uh, at the start of 2021, we had a rather large milestone in terms of our application to have proton beam therapy listed uh, on Medicare approved. And that, that helped uh, to firm up uh, the, the types of indications that we would be uh, focusing on at the Australian Bragg Centre and informing the design so that we optimise the design to, to uh, treat those patient cohorts. Uh, final design completion was, was reached earlier this year um, and uh, there was a process of, of ironing out any uh, ongoing issues with the final design. Um, site remediation was complete um, relatively recently, so around about August this year. 
and our radiation facility stage two license uh, was also recently granted and that, that gives us permission to start construction of the Australian Bragg Centre. And uh, the final um, milestone that you see there is a prototype bunker wall uh, being constructed and I'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. So um, it has been almost four and a half years since the uh, federal budget commitment. I know from, from outside the project, it may seem like there are periods where nothing has been happening, but I, I can um, wholeheartedly say that uh, there has been a lot of work ongoing through that whole time. It is a very large, uh, complex project, and, and sometimes these things take time to, to work out. So who, uh, who's involved in the design and construction of the building? So I'll start off with SAMRI. So SAMRI is the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. Um, and they're the proton therapy equipment owner and the tenants of the proton therapy area. Uh, commercial and general are the property developers and they also offer project management um, on behalf of SAMRI. Uh, SAMRI have contracted Potom International uh, to be the proton therapy equipment vendor. Commercial and general have contracted Lendlease to be the, uh, the lead building contractor. And then under Lendlease sit the architects for the building as a whole, uh, that's Woods Baggett, and also Oricon are the service engineers. WGA are the structural engineers. And then uh, importantly, so uh, Lendlease have contracted um, two US firms that have uh, quite a large experience in designing uh, proton therapy centers. So Stantec are the proton therapy area architects and BR plus A are the proton therapy service engineers. So these, these two companies have a, have a lot of experience in proton therapy design and, and build, and that's been really important to us in, in reducing the risk of design in, in this facility. So SAMRI is also uh, engaged SA Health to provide a clinical reference group, and that consists of uh, radiation oncologists, radiation therapists, and a whole group of other specialists that, that have helped us uh, inform the, the design of the, the radiation facility. And SAMRI has also recently incorporated the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research, and that will be the proton therapy uh, business entity. Commercial and general also need to work with other tenants of the building. And then Dexus is the actual owner of the building itself. And then there's many other um, entities involved in the design as well. So it's I guess it's not so important who these actual entities are. I wanted to present this to give you the impression um, that this is a very complex um, uh, design and build. There are many stakeholders. Um, so it, it has been a very involved process with trying to manage time zones. Uh, there have been a lot of early morning and, and late night conversations, um, but thank you to everyone for, for uh, bearing with us and, and getting us to where we are now. So the Australian Bragg Centre is the building as a whole. It is a 15 floor building. Uh, it's roughly in the centre of the Adelaide Biomed City precinct. Um, and so it's this building, I'll just bring up a laser pointer. Building in the middle, um, and we're meeting in this building here today. So uh, levels zero to three mezzanine will be occupied by the Australian Bragg Centre for proton therapy and research. Levels four to six will house an expansion of SAMRI's uh, personnel. And levels seven to 14 uh, will be for other tenants that are related to health, medical service and research. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, acknowledge all the great work done by Julie McCrossan, who's a great friend of the project. So uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, Julie conducted a six part webinar series uh, where she spoke to a number of different groups. And the idea of this was to try and inform how we can improve the patient and family experience. Um, and Julie, uh, together with people uh, on the, the Bragg Centre team, uh, reached out to a number of different entities to provide that input. And that input was used to inform um, the, the design of the facility and, and trying to make sure that we are doing our best to accommodate those, uh, those patients with the special needs. 
So the Australian Bragg Centre um, for Proton Therapy and Research, as I said, it occupies level zero to three mezzanine. Uh, so where it starts is on the plaza level. Uh, so coming in off North Terrace, that's actually level three. That's the entry level. I'll go into the detail of these uh, levels in the coming slides. From level three, patients have a dedicated uh, lift through which they can access the treatment level. And that's where the proton therapy systems, imaging systems, uh, review clinics, um, all of the, the meats and bones of the proton therapy center are located on level zero. And then on 3M is a staff workspace. So we have open um, plan seating and some office space for management as well. So to go into a bit more detail on each of those uh, levels. So entry level, um, people and patients can come in from North Terrace. Uh, they'll be greeted, greeted by reception staff. And there's also a, a waiting area there as well. Uh, the radiation oncologist consult and office rooms are located on that level. Uh, and there'll also be a children's playroom uh, to, to entertain the children while they're waiting on that level. And as I mentioned, there's a dedicated lift uh, that goes down to the treatment level. So a dedicated lift is just in this back corner next to the reception desk. Okay, uh, the treatment level, it's, it's pretty busy. Um, so I'm just gonna point out these things on the left there. But uh, what I'll draw your attention to to start with is the uh, lift and the lift entry and reception location, which is pretty much in the center of the building. Um, so patients and families come down to this dedicated uh, level and they're again greeted by reception staff there. So on this level, uh, we'll start with the, uh, the technical stuff. So the synchrotron accelerator is located in the, the back corner of the facility. And we have two gantry treatment rooms. These are 180 degree gantries. Um, and this is an artist's render of, of what the final uh, room design looks like. So it's designed to be open and, and non-confronting for uh, patients as, as they enter. Uh, so what we're looking at there is uh, the proton therapy nozzle is here, uh, 180 degree gantry around which that proton nozzle can rotate and a patient positioning system here. Uh, through those doors are the, the back of house machinery of the, the gantry. Uh, so that's where the Proton staff can access all of that equipment. We also have one fixed beam room as well, which has two beam lines that enter the room. Uh, moving along, we have a CT simulator and also an MR simulator. There will be an anesthetic recovery. Because of the uh, relatively high number of pediatric patients we expect to see at the facility, uh, there, there does need to be dedicated anesthetic recovery space. And we have allocated three uh, recovery locations there. And there's also a pediatric prep, uh, a re anesthetic uh, preparation uh, room as well. So in terms of um, waiting rooms down on this treatment level, we have a dedicated children's playroom uh, that will look something like this. Uh, so that, that should um, keep children entertained and give, give them a location through which they can interact with other children uh, if they feel so inclined. There's a dedicated adolescent waiting room as well that will have um, different support structures for those, for those patients and then general purpose waiting areas um, to be used by, by adults for the facility. So all of these waiting areas are access controlled. Um, the patients and families can't access uh, other areas on this level uh, um, without uh, essentially being swiped through to the next area. And so this is the reception and, and waiting area on treatment level. So when the patients um, uh, are being prepared for their time on the treatment machine, they'll be asked to go through to a gowned waiting room. So we have a, a male and a female gowned waiting room. And, and that was done to make sure that we optimize efficiency of the patient flow uh, through the facility. Uh, other specialist rooms, so we have a research preparation lab uh, that has been designed to physical control um, level one. Uh, so we're, we're more so looking at in vitro um, preparation in that location. And we also have a physics lab uh, in that location there. 
So moving up now to the uh, mezzanine level. Um, so this is a staff only area. Um, teleconference rooms will be there, open plan workspace, uh, seating for 30 there, and some, some office spaces as well for management. So uh, just to give you an idea of how, how this all comes together, um, it is extremely complex with all of the highly technical Proton equipment that needs to go in um, and all of the service engineering that goes into the building. So we have a very useful 3D design tool that allows us to see where these things sit in, um, in a 3D model. And from a personal perspective, um, having this, this design tool is absolutely key in informing the radiation shielding uh, modeling. Uh, it's very difficult to try and picture where penetrations through the bunker uh, are located and how they run based on 2D uh, architectural sketches. So having this 3D model that I can just go to uh, by myself when I need to and see how, see how things are uh, positioned in three dimensions is, is very useful uh, specifically for radiation shielding from my perspective. So in terms of radiation protection, so this, uh, this will be Australia's highest energy proton accelerator. The, the Radiance 330, as the name indicates, can go up to 330 mega electron volts. Um, so it's the, it's the highest energy commercial uh, proton therapy system on the market. And that higher energy is intended to be used for proton imaging applications and not just uh, for treatment. Uh, because of the high energy, it does have unique radiation protection regulatory requirements. So in terms of our assessment of the radiation shielding, what we look at are dose rates around the facility. We use Monte Carlo calculations to model those dose rates. Um, and because of the large uh, amount of neutrons that are produced, we also need to consider radio activation of the building, the soil beneath and around the building, air in the treatment rooms, uh, cooling water that is used to uh, cool the, the proton therapy magnets, uh, the proton therapy equipment itself. So um, some protons are, are lost into the equipment and so they become activated. And so all these things need to be considered and um, calculated. We've summarized that information for the EPA uh, to make an assessment of the radiation safety of the facility. And indeed, we do work very closely with the EPA. Uh, we have at least monthly meetings or fortnightly meetings as we're ramping up to a, a stage um, licensing progression. Um, and, and really our goal, as well as the EPA's goal, is to uh, make sure the facility is designed and operated to keep radiation exposure as low as reasonably achievable to staff and members of the public. Uh, so this, this document there, the prelim preliminary safety analysis report, is, is the key document that uh, allowed us to progress from uh, the preparation to facility construction. And the EPA have a, a special team um, consisting of both local and international experts that review uh, this report. To give you a, a graphical refer, representation of uh, what the facility, uh, what the radiation shielding calculations look like. So this is one snippet uh, where we looked at annual dose rates that are expected around the facility. Uh, so it's, it's all done with Monte Carlo um, and, and the EPA also required us to have a full independent Monte Carlo calculation set done as well. So we have a defense in depth approach where uh, there are a number of independent uh, checks going through this process as well. So where, where are we up to at the moment? Uh, for the people online that can't join us today, uh, so we, we are in this auditorium right here um, and the, the building site next door is where the Australian Bragg Centre is uh, going to be coming out of the ground. So to orient you, uh, what we're looking at here, so the synchrotron is located in this back corner here. Uh, the beam line runs along this corridor up here and this pit, these pits that you can see here are where the gantry, um, uh, the rotating gantry can be rotated beneath the treatment level. Um, and, and this space over here is uh, the, the general clinic support space. So you might be able to see uh, the scale of all of this. So you can see some tiny little builders on the site there. Um, and to, to give you some reference, so the, the gantry bunkers will essentially go from the height of the bottom of this pit 
all the way up to um, the plaza level here. So it's almost 17 metres in height um, that the gantry uh, bunkers occupy. So this 17 metres in height and two metre thick walls um, around a lot of the facility amounts to an absolutely enormous amount of concrete. Um, it's very expensive in, in, in all of the shielding of uh, gantry systems for proton therapy. Um, so we want to make sure that we get things absolutely right. I mentioned at the start that we um, are constructing a bunker wall prototype. Uh, so this is this has been constructed off site, and uh, this this was all put together over the last month or so. Uh, so this is a two meter thick um, example of one of the walls that will act as the shielding. Um, and and in this prototype, we the, the build team have designed all of the various types of penetrations that we will see in the facilities. And it gives them a, a trial run to make sure that uh, when, when it comes to doing the real thing on site, that um, they have all the hitches ironed out and everything will come together uh, really smoothly. Um, so the EPA, uh, the EPA project manager was on site a couple of weeks ago inspecting the prototype wall. And since that time, the prototype wall has been filled with uh, concrete um, and and there will be a period over which that concrete cures and we'll do some testing on the cured concrete after a certain period of time and then we can commence construction on site. So where to from here? Um, so bunker construction will start over the next month or two. Um, from there it's about nine months until bunker uh, completion. A further 12 months from there we're able to have uh, we hope to see practical completion of the building. So that's all the other floors uh, being essentially completed and, and fitted out. Um, 10 months from, or well, sorry, at that at practical completion as well is when the proton therapy equipment installation begins. And it can only begin at that point uh, because there's certain uh, support uh, equipment that's located on the roof of the building to provide a, a, a suitable environment for the, uh, those level zero floors. Uh, to, to make it suitable for the proton therapy equipment to go in. 10 months after proton therapy equipment install begins, um, we uh, are programmed to, to see proton finishing the fixed beam room installation and testing. Uh, in parallel with the fixed beam room, gantry one will also be being assembled and installed, as well as gantry two being assembled and installed. So we have shorter periods uh, for proton to install and test the components in those rooms. So it is, it is still um, a little ways to go. We are running on a contract schedule at the moment for the construction. So we, we hope to um, continue to hit those milestones. And just finally, um, some non-construction updates that might be of interest for the project uh, in general. Um, so as I mentioned, we had great news with um, the Department of Health um, supporting SAMRI's application for specific paediatric AYA and rare adult cancers to be approved for proton beam therapy. That, that news came through in early 2021. And we've been informed by the Department of Health that they intend to list those numbers uh, in 2024, uh, ready for the commencement of patient treatments later that year. Uh, in terms of moving forward, for so the, the, what is currently approved is a fairly specific indication list. Um, so the, the plan from here is to await the results of international clinical studies um, prior to considering whether we expand that indication list. And we'd really like to do that um, in partnership with other stakeholders. Uh, we've also got funding for new positions through the Hospital Research Foundation. So over the next few weeks, we'll be holding interviews for a comparative planning coordinator, a comparative planning therapist, part-time medical physicist, and a cl clinical implementation project manager, as well as some part-time uh, employment and radiation oncology consultants. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That, that was just an amazing overview of, of what, what is an amazingly complex undertaking by many people. So I think we've got time just for one question. So if anybody from the room or online wants to ask it, please go ahead. Um, first, uh, Scott, when do we hope the first patient will be treated? What type of patient is that likely to be? Thank you, Julie, for your question. 
Yeah, great, great question, Julie. Um, so the first treatment room that will come online will be the fixed beam room. So we, um, the fixed beam room only has certain beam angles that can be used to, to treat patients. Um, so the, um, those type of patients will be specific uh, intracranial sites. So the type of cancer will be uh, a little dictated by what, what can be accommodated on the fixed beam room. Uh, we hope to see the fixed beam room coming online uh, towards the very end of, of 2024 or at the start of 2025. Scott, I, Richard Amos has also just asked another question. Um, so has there been patient throughput modeling done that includes the proton imaging at uh, 330 MeV for the Bragg Center? Furthermore, have workload estimates for radiation shielding modeling included this high energy proton imaging workflow? Uh, yep. So that's another great question. And indeed, um, we have incorporated proton imaging into the workload factors. Um, and the way that we've structured the workload is that we, um, we break down the full energy spectrum available into three representative energy levels. Um, so we, we model um, a certain percentage of patients uh, being imaged at 330 MeV, even though that is only required um, for, for the largest uh, section of the patient. So we've made a number of conservative estimates around how the energy of the accelerator gets used and the, the production of secondary neutrons is very energy dependent as well. So it's important to, to make conservative estimates, but yes, absolutely. Um, workload estimates have included um, patient throughput modeling and the types of energies that are required for those patients.